Um, so, hello everybody again. This week we are talking about functions. Now, in relation to what we have done so far, in week three we learned about global and local scope. And we learned how to use global and local scope for branching. So we created an if, we had code inside the block of code in the if that was only executed when the if statement evaluated to true. In last week, in week four, we have, uh, um, sorry, loops. Couldn't think of the word for a second. We have loops. Same thing happens. When the loop evaluates to true, the block of code inside the loop gets executed. Well, this week is a continuation. We have functions this week, which means now we get to name our block of code. So we get to name it. We get to kind of write it and put it down and let it be until we call it. So you write a function and then you call a function. And this week is all about how you write a function. Kind of why. So the why is reusability. As I said last week, this is my favorite topic in programming. I love reusability because it makes my life easier. Um, because it reduces the amount of code that you have to write and maintain. Now we're going to use reusability and we get to give it a name. So, we have a new keyword this week. The keyword is def, D-E-F, and this tells Python that you are defining a function. A function is in two parts. You define a function and then in the, later on in the code you call a function. So the first thing you have to do is define it. The function has to be defined before it's called. We have some new concepts. We have the concept of an argument. And an argument is a value passed to a function, usually through a variable. We have a parameter. A parameter is a placeholder in the function definition, and it acts as a local variable inside the function. And it receives the values that are passed during the function call. So an argument is in the function call and a parameter is in the function definition. Function call activates the function. It says, Python, you know that function you stored? Well, now I want you to actually do something with it. So let's talk about the basics. A function is simply a named group of code that usually has a specific purpose. And that purpose can be just about anything. Um, for, for what we're doing and for what you're going to do in the project, the purpose is going to be something like moving between rooms. And we'll talk a little bit about that tonight as well, and we'll talk a little bit about that next week. And basically, it's a means of grouping code for reusability. You've got some kind of algorithm you've written, and you want that algorithm to be able to be used anywhere you want, and so you put it in a function and you name it. So here is how you define a function, and this is challenge 511, and we can go look at it when we're done, but actually we'll probably look at uh, one of the more complicated ones in PyCharm. Def is a keyword that tells Python to, one, don't immediately execute the stuff under this function definition and register this function for later, which means it's going to take this function, take this group of code, and it's going to store it. It's not going to execute it, it's going to store it. A function name must be unique to all other functions, um, to all other function names in your code. It's that simple, it's got to be unique. And in this case, our function name is print underscore pattern. And a function name is very much like a variable name. In fact, it follows most of the same rules. Um, so we have the keyword def first, the function name second, third we have at minimum opening and closing parentheses. Now for print pattern, it's just opening and closing parentheses, that's all it is. Later on, we're going to start adding things into those parentheses and see how they work. 
and the parentheses tell and what's inside them tells Python how much data to expect. What are are you getting any data in? And if so, how much? And and then it defines those uh, parameters, which are like local variables. And then the function itself will have a local scope, which is just a, clo a code block inside the function that's only available when you call the function and does something. Now this, it's just printing five stars. Um, and this block of code and, code, and I'll say it again, will only be executed when the print pattern, when print pattern is called. So a couple of rules. A function declaration is started with the keyword def. And I usually, and for this class always, a function definition is always in the global scope. Rule number two, the function declaration has to end with a colon, just like loops, just like branches. That colon tells it when the declaration stops, when the first line of that declaration stops. A function requires an opening and closing parentheses. Has to at least have that. Without that, it's not a function definition. So I just showed you how to define it. Now I'm going to show you how to call it. Because remember I said there's two parts. That there's the definition, which is just stored until you call it. So here we have print pattern again. And then underneath that, I have two calls to print pattern. So let's see what happens. I have two of the same calls to print pattern right down here. Now, those are in the global scope. And when I call print pattern, Python is going to execute the line of code in print pattern. It's going to output, in this case, five stars to the console. And since I called print pattern again, it's going to do the same thing a second time. You have to define the function before it's called. And you always call a function by using its name. And a function tells Python, a function call tells Python to run the code inside the function definition. So actually, let me pull up PyCharm real quick. And it's 511. So I just I added a few more lines here in this one. Let me add the interpreter. I don't know why it keeps asking me to do this. Add a local interpreter. Uh, OK. Thank you. So if we, I don't know why I did that. Anyway, so I'm going to edit the configuration 511. And I'm just going to put this through the debugger for just a minute because I want you to see what happens. Now you'll notice there is a red dot, which is a breakpoint in PyCharm, that says stop here. And then, and that's on line three. And then on line seven, I have another red dot that says stop here. And actually, I'm going to do this again just so we can make it more like what we saw on the slide. So. Given everything we've talked about so far and what we've seen, oftentimes you think, well, because this is Python is in the interpreter and it's running through each line of code, that it's going to stop at line three. But I don't think it's going to do that. I think it's going to stop at line seven. So let's see what it does. OK, so the first time, the first line of code that Python stops at is line seven. Now, as we've talked about in the interpreter before, the blue line in PyCharm means that you are on the line of code, but you have not yet executed the line of code. So, but if we look at this, all this code was before line 7. That is because what Python did when it first went through line, from line 2 to line 6, it said, hey, I have a def, which means I'm defining a function. So then I'm going to name the function print pattern and everything that is in the local block of local scope of this function is going to be stored. It's not going to be run. The interpreter is not going to do anything with it. And then when it gets to the first line of executable code that is in the global scope, which is line seven on print pattern, then it's going to do something. 
So now let's see, I'm going to step into, by the way, so far when I've used the debugger, I've always stepped over. And that's okay. Now I'm going to step into the code. So I'm stepping into a function. So I'm stepping into the function and now I'm on line three. I'm, I'm, the interpreter is waiting for me to, to tell it to execute. And if we go over here to the console, we see that I have all these wonderful stars printing out. I'm now on line eight. I'm going to step into it again. I go back into my print pattern function and then I print those things out. So now let's look at a couple of gotchas. First of all, all I did was backspace line three. And see, I got all these lovely little red squiggly. Sorry, let me make this bigger. I got all these lovely little red squiggly lines. And that is because Python is expecting that there is going to be an indentation after the function definition because that's how you put it in the local scope. Right now, def print pattern is defined in the global scope. And print is, should be defined in the local scope of print pattern. But it's not right now, it's in the global scope. So if I attempt to run this, I get an indentation error, expected an indented block. It's a syntax error, and Python, luckily on this one, is telling me what to do. So if I simply tab, I'm no longer in error. So let me show you how to make a logic error, not a syntax, because Python's not going to tell me that this is wrong. I'm going to take line five and I'm going to backspace. Now, line five is in the global scope, and line three and four is in the local scope of the function, but line five isn't. So I run this. I don't have the same number of stars, actually. Let me do this. I'm going to debug this. When I go through the debugger, right now I am starting. I, I've, I stop on line five. I should have stopped at line seven. Why, didn't, why did I stop at line five? Because I did not properly have this print indented. So if I indent it and I start again, now I stop at line seven. So there's the issue with scope. And a lot, I see a lot of students who are just using to do functions do that. They forget that they have the scope and they, they don't indent properly. And that's one of the things that I find a little maddening about Python is that you can easily get a logic error simply because your spacing is off. So let's go to the next one. So we just learned how to call a function, but it had empty parentheses. So now we're going to learn to call a function that has, or we're going to learn to define, and then we'll learn to call a function that has arguments. So this is challenge 523, and basically we want to print the total inches. So um, we print the number of feet and the number of inches, and it prints out the total number of inches. So. I have my def keyword, just like I had before. I have my function name. In this case, my function name is print total inches. I have an open parenthesis, and then I have the word num underscore feet. Num underscore feet is essentially a local variable, and what it's telling Python in the function definition is expect a value to be passed here. Then I have a comma. And then I have another word, num underscore inches, and it is a parameter as well, and it's telling Python expect a value. So to print total inches is expecting to be called with two values. And the first value will be in the variable num underscore feet, and the second variable will be in the value num underscore inches. And as always, we have to make sure it ends with a colon, and you have to make sure it's got an opening and closing parentheses around the parameters. So then in the function block, we have total inches equal num feet times 12 plus num inches. And then I'm going to print the total inches. 
A um, couple of rules. A parameter is a variable that exists only inside the function. So num feet will be usable inside the function print total inches, but if you if you create a variable num feet outside, it won't be the same num feet. It'll be different. Um, and then num inches is the same. It's a local variable. So this is the definition part. Remember, it's a two-part thing. There's the definition and there's the calling. Uh, okay. I think that's all I wanted to say. So now let's talk about how we call this. So it's the same challenge. We're just going to call print total inches. So I have the function definition, and then underneath that, I have num feet, num inches, and print total in my script. You'll notice that num feet equals int blah blah blah, num inches equal int blah blah blah, and print total inches all are left justified just like the def for print total inches, but the local scope of the print total inches function is tabbed in once for each line. Now that's the minimum. You can tab in more if you have if statements or loops or anything like that. So let's just see what happens when Professor Lisa enters a 5 and enters an 8. So num feet is 5 and num inches is 8. When I call print total inches, basically Python takes the value from num feet in my print total inches function call and moves it to num feet in my function um, and then does the same with num inches and then I get an output. So here's something to know about passing arguments. Arguments are passed by value for the most part, um, which means the function, the, the name of the parameters and, and the name of the argument are irrelevant. It is positional. So it, I could have had x and y in the function call, and as long as x was 5 and y was 8, you would get this. Okay? So num feet in the global scope is completely different than num feet in the local scope, and it could have been x and y in the global scope and num feet and num inches in the local scope. It is positional, and it is passed by value. So I'm going to pass the value 5 and I'm going to pass the value 8 into the function call. The function call must have the same number of arguments as the function definition has parameters. So I have two parameters in my function definition. Therefore, in my function call, I have to have two arguments. Oh, and I'm sorry, I haven't checked to see if anybody has questions. Okay. So, I just wanted to talk a little bit about argument and order. So, we, saw, we just saw this. We have print total inches. It's the same calculation. Nothing about that has changed. However, now I'm going to move num inches and num feet. So, I just switched them in the function call. So now num inches is going to be 8. Sorry, num inches is going to be 5 and num feet is going to be 8. And so all of a sudden our outcome is different because it's going to be 8 times 12 plus 5 rather than 5 times 12 plus 5. So it's 101 rather than 98. Arguments are positional. If you change the order of the argument when you call, you're going to change the outcome of, you could change the outcome of the function because the data is going to go in there different. So just understand that the name, I, I know that a lot of students get this a little confused. The name of the argument has no relationship to the name of the parameter. It is completely and only positional. Okay, so return, actually, no, I want to go, let's go look at something here. Which one is that? Okay, so 
this is the return one. We'll go this one. Okay, so we're going, this is kind of what we just saw. We have print total inches. Let me make this bigger. I apologize. Okay, we have print total inches. We have the feet and the inches. And again, here I didn't put num feet and num inches. I just put feet and inches. So let's see what happens. Now if I set this up in the debugger, whoops, sorry about that. Let me set this up in the debugger and turn off my notifications. Uh, okay, no, for an hour. All right, sorry about that. So five, two, three. So I'm going to debug this because we all know how much I like the debugger. So nothing happened up here. It just read in print total inches and stored it off to the side. Now I'm going to say I want the feet and I want the inches. So I'm going to step over feet equal. I'm going to go to the console and I'm going to say feet equal 10 and inches equal 7. So I have 10 and 7. Whoops, sorry about that. There we go. So now I'm going to call print total inches. Oh, sorry. I did that wrong. Let me stop. All right, let's try this again. All right. I'm on the console. I'm going to step over. I'm going to print 10, 4 feet. I'm going to step over. I'm going to print 7 for, I'm going to input 7 for inches. I have feet and inches. So now let us step into, here's the step into in the debugger. It's the down arrow. And now I come in and I see that, and this is the nice thing about PyCharm, it will tell me what the value of each parameter is. Num feet is 10, num inches is 7. So, I'm going to do my calculation and then I'm going to print it. Now, stepping over that, I'm going to call it again and I switched inches and feet. So it's going to be 7 and 10. So if I step into, because I switched those parameters, my data going into the function is different. Yes. Okay, um, what a debugger does it, is it allows you to see what is happening in the code as you run it. And for an interpreted language like Python, it can be very helpful. I use a debugger all the time um, because I, sometimes I'm writing complex code and it, the logic can get very difficult to follow, so I set it up so I can test it and see the flow. Step over basically says execute this line of code. Python runs in an interpreter. Every single line of code that it comes in contact with, that it knows it's supposed to execute, gets executed. Step over means execute this line of code. Step into says have a function and I want to step into the function so I can execute the, I can see the execution of those lines of code as opposed to step over where it would just execute them without you looking at them. So I'm in PyCharm. Um, when I am here, this is PyCharm. This is my PyCharm. So um, yes, PyCharm has it. And you'll see this blue line here. This blue line is an indication in PyCharm that I am I am on line six, but I haven't yet executed it. So now, and you'll see over here right now, it has total inches equal num feet. Now, as soon as I step over this, I can see that total inches is 94. 
and then it's going to print total inches and if I look down here at the console and I step over that it's going to print 94 so and I'm I have just I'm going to step over and the program's going to end but that's what step over does so if I debug this again and by the way, these are breakpoints. And all you do to get a breakpoint is you just click by the number and you'll get a breakpoint. And a breakpoint says stop here. So, and in fact, I'm not going to stop there. I'm going to continue and I'm just going to put in um, 8 and uh, 9 just as numbers. So what PyCharm is nice enough to do is it will tell me what a value is for an individual variable. And if I click this little down arrow here by that, it'll say what it is. So I can say later on it's a list, it's a, it's a complex object. Um, and then here I have inches is 9. So I could step over. So I'm going to step over right now. And what you will see is it doesn't go in to my function it just executes it so I get 105 out if I do step in what it will do is it will go to the first line of executable code inside the function that's line 6 so we're going to step over and it's going to say my total inches is 116 because it did this calculation and then it's going to print total inches and I'm done so that is what step over and step into is for. Does that help, Rebecca? Yes, thank you. No problem. Okay. Uh, let's go to the next one. Oh, sorry. Here we go. Returns. So now I know how to get data in to the function. But how do I get data out? Maybe, oh, hold on, sorry, my uh, my nephew is here and he's unhappy, my sister will be here. So if you hear a baby in the background, sorry about that. He will, um, he, he'll be fine. <laughs> my sister's coming now. Um, so you can get data out of the function just like you can get data into a function. Here we have our definition print uh, pyramid volume is the name of the function we have three variables base length base width and pyramid height and then I just have this pyramid calculation that they gave me in uh, books. now I have this return thing this return statement basically says pass a piece of data back to the calling function. So, sorry about that. We're just, and a return only happens, you will only ever see a return inside a function definition, and return is a keyword. I apologize for not putting it in the keyword chart. Um, and what I am passing back really is the value in the variable pyramid. And it's because I'm probably going to want to use it in my calling function. Now, for what you're going to need to use in your code, you're going to need to um, you're going to need to pass back the new room when you've moved between rooms. So, a return is exclusively used inside of a function block. My apologies. Obviously, my animations are in the wrong order on this slide. Um, okay, so we got the local scope. We'll just go through. And yeah, return tells Python to return the value back. So now, just like, hold on, I need to start this one again. So now, just like with any other function call, you are going to call the function with the right number of arguments. In this case, I am calling pyramid volume with a length of 45, 4.5, a length, uh, width of 2.1, and a height of 3.0. So these values, because it's passed by value, just go and get, um, you just go and you set their local variables. 
The calculation is 9.5, and I pass that back with the return statement. So you'll notice that for this function call, there's a difference. I have pyramid equal underscore pyramid volume. So I have a variable on the left-hand side of the function call with an assignment operator in the middle. That is telling Python, A, you're expecting a variable back, and B, put that, sorry, you're expecting a value back, and B, put that value into a variable named pyramid. Now, pyramid didn't have to be named pyramid. It could have been X, it could have been Y, it could have been anything. Um, but what it does is it puts that value, in this case 9.45, into the um, into the val sorry into the variable pyramid so that I can use it in my print statement. Now, when you're working on your um, when you're working on your program, when you're work yeah your your game, you're going to have to create a function called move between rooms, and that function will take in your current room as a parameter and your direction as a parameter and it will have to output what the new room is. So that's when a return will become very important to you in this class. So, um, so let's go and take a look at that one so we can see that. Okay, it's not going to stop there. 5.3.3 uh, let's do that. Um, sorry for the noise in the background, guys. So I am debugging, and um, give me just a second. I'm going to go someplace where that noise isn't. All right. Okay. Debbie, I'm going to go in your room. I'm going to go in your room, I guess. Um, or in the other room. Here, I'll just go in here. There's no way where to sit. If you go in here, there's a little rocking chair. Thing All right, there. thanks. Sorry about that. Okay. Sorry about that, everyone. My uh, nephew decided to wake up and be my nephew. That's okay. Actually, he's my great nephew. So, I can think again. So this is our pyramid volume function. If I debug this, I'm just going to input two, whoops, actually we don't need to stop there. I'm going to debug this. I'm going to input two, four, and six. So now I have a length of two, a height of four, a uh, width of four, and a height of six. So now I'm going to call pyramid volume. I'm going to step in again. I'm going to do my calculation. And the nice thing about PyCharm is it tells you over here what the values are. I'm going to do my calculation. My, the pyramid value is 16. Now when I step over, you're going to see that, and I step over this, you're going to see that XXX is now 16. And I made it XXX just so that you could see that the, the name doesn't matter. And now I'm going to use XXX in my global scope. So, Let's create a couple of issues here. First of all, if I backspace here, I get, I don't get a logic error. I get a syntax error. And that syntax error is because return can only happen inside the local scope of the function. And I just told it not to. So if I run this, I'm going to get syntax error return outside the function. Now this is one of the nicer um, the nicer um, error messages. Computer programmers write horrible error messages. 
This one actually tells you where the problem is. Now, let's look at something else. Let me just remove height from here for a second. Now, let's see what happens if I attempt to run this without height. So I'm going to put in 2 and 4 and what? wait a minute, am I running or debugging? Okay, let's try it again. I'm going to debug and I'm going to put in 2 and 4 and 6. So let's see what happens because I only get pass in two things. So I'm going to step into this and I get this nasty little error here and I, if I go to the console I have this exception. Type error, pyramid volume missing one required positional argument pyramid height. That is because I only called it with two arguments when it should have been called with three arguments. So this is Python telling me I'm missing one of my arguments. So we'll just fix that. And we'll be back to being okay. So that's what will happen if you don't have all of your arguments. So if you're writing your move between rooms or any of the other functions and you get that error, then you know um, that you're missing an argument and the, uh, the parent, there's one more parameter or there's some number more parameters than there are arguments. So let's talk about scope again. This is just to indicate, this is just a reminder because scope is so important and they don't really call it out in Dow books. Scope dictates when a variable or in fact a line of code is available for use. And there are four basic scopes. We only really care about two of them. We care about the local scope, a variable is defined inside a class or a function or code or any other kind of code block like a branch or a loop. Global is out in the top level program. So if I look at this, I just want to talk about scope and make sure everybody's clear. The function name is always in the global scope, period. The parameters are variables that are in the local scope. So they're not available to the wider program. They're only available inside the local scope of the function. The return is only available inside the local scope, but it's a transition point. It transitions a value or a series of values from the local scope into the global scope. That's, and it's just like arguments the other way. Arguments are available in the calling scope, which is usually the global scope for what we're doing, but it may not always be. The calling scope an, is in, sorry, an argument is in the calling scope and it's a transition point. It transitions from the global scope into the local scope of the function. So you have to have those transition points defined properly and used properly or your functions are never going to work. So. All of that just said, there's something called arguments and mutability. What this does is, in Python, everything is an object. An integer is an object, a boolean is an object, a string is definitely an object. If we pass something that is mutable, like a list, into a function, when we modify that list inside the function, it becomes modified outside the function. So here, what I have is I have a function called swap, and it's 5.12.1. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass a list in, and I'm going to take the first element and make it the last element in the list. 
So what was passed in is here good things just end all. And what is going to end up is going to be all good things just end here. Now what happens is when I, you'll notice there's no return statement. When I switch that list around, because a list is mutable, it gets automatically modified in the calling scope. So I called swap values, and then I print values, but this is one of the issues that, that can be confusing. You don't need the return statement here. Now, you're not going to need this. You're not going to need this for any of your labs. You're not going to need this for your project. I just wanted to bring it up so that you guys understood that there is one other way to do it, and that is through uh, arguments. Lots of personal lots of elements. I think uh, actually the one of the labs does actually need that. Does it does? Which one does? Uh, oh, sorry, I didn't realize. It was, I was thinking that the second lab actually needed that feature, but I could be wrong. This one? No, the second there's lab. There's the exact change, and then there's another one this week. So this is lab 5.18, and that's swap values. It's not you're not swapping a list. You're actually swapping the values around. Okay. So while it's swap, it's you're passing in two integers and then you're swapping them and passing them back out. So even though they're both named swap, the one in the slide that we were just talking about um, was only done just to show you the mutability of a list. This swap takes a, takes integers or A, B, or C. No, it's integers, isn't it? No, it's just it's whatever. It can be a string. It can be whatever. Um, okay, so we did that. Default parameter values. Um, so I lied just a little bit ago when I said that if you have a function that has three arguments or two arguments or one argument, you have to call that with the same number of parameters. I lied. It's not exactly that way. Python, as, as, as with some other languages, has the ability to have what they call default values for their parameters. And what you do, the syntax for this, is that you simply, in the function definition, you give it a default value by assigning that parameter to a value. So here I have def number of pennies, number of pennies, dollars comma pennies equals zero. That pennies equals zero tells Python that if you don't actually um, send in a value, then what I'm going to do is just assume zero. So I can call it with nothing. I can call it with one argument, or I can call it with two arguments. If I call it with three arguments, it'll still be a syntax error. So let us actually go and, yeah, my, sorry, my uh, animation is off again. I apologize. So let's go and actually look at 513.1 and come on, come on, computer. There we go. So this one is what we just saw. We have a number of pennies, and we want to find the number of pennies um, given dollars and pennies that we had. So, and here I have two function calls. I have one print number of pennies with one input. And then I have print number of pennies with two arguments. So this is the first argument, and this is the second argument. By the way, if this looks a little confusing, that you could pull this into input out. This is just, this right here is simply 
putting the input into the argument itself. And if this looks confusing, let me know, and we will just take it and put it in, um, we'll just put it in our own separate variables. So if I debug this, I start here, oh, wait a minute, there we go. Oh, never mind, that was the wrong debug. That was a step through. Oh, sorry, hold on. There we go. So, I, um, I'm here on print number, and I just didn't stop up here to show you that it was reading it in. So it's gonna say, I'm going to want to print the number of pennies, and I'm going to call here number of pennies in the function call to print, because you can do that. So if I'm in the call and I'm going to print, uh, I've just, I'm just doing one input, so I'm going to say 102, and I'm going to step over, oh, sorry, what's going on? Let's do this again. My bad. Stop and rerun. So I'm going to step over and I'm going to print, I'm going to say 102, hit the enter key, and I got 102.00. That's how many number of pennies. Actually, let me do it like this so that we can actually see it go into the function. Let's do it again. So let me do 102. I'm going to step over. What is this doing? All right. I'm going to step over. All right. One more time. I'm going to step over. I'm going to print. Maybe it's just in like my number. 105. Now I'm here, and I, you'll see that it says pennies is zero, dollars is 105. I only had one argument in here. And that one argument went to dollars because it's positional. By the way, default, defining default uh, parameters with default values has to come at the end. You can't put it at the beginning, and I'll show you what happens in a minute if you do. So I'm going to step over. It's going to print. Now it's going to ask me again, and I'm going to do this twice. So I'm going to step over, and I'm going to say 42, and I'm going to say 3, just for numbers. So now I'm in here, and you'll see that even though pennies has a default value of zero, we get a three because we passed in two arguments. And dollar has 42, and when we step over, we're going to print 4203. So what happens if I switch that order? If I say dollars is zero, dollars has a default value of zero, and pennies doesn't have a default value. I have a syntax error. Now, automatically in PyCharm, know it's a syntax error because I get my little squigglies. If I attempt to run this, I get a no default argument found default argument. And it's pointing at pennies, and it's saying pennies needs a default argument. That's true. It does need a default argument if the argument in front of it had a default argument. But I can do this, and all of a sudden that goes away. And that's because you have to define parameters that have default arguments at the end. They have to be at the end. It's just a construct of PyCharm or Python. So I can go back to having my equal zero, and everybody's happy. Um, multiple return values. Python's really cool in that you can have more than one return value, return, yeah, return value from 
a function. Java doesn't do that. A lot of other languages don't do this. But in Python, you can simply return different different variables, different or different values, multiple. So you will have a lab this week where you're going to have to return dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies all in the same return statement. How do you do this? Well, you do it by simply listing with a comma in between them the different variables you want. So here, I want to return list one and list two. I've just moved some stuff around from list one and list two. And now I want to return them. So I'm just going to return list one, comma, list two. And I will return list one and list two in that order. The order is important here. If I look at my function call move it, I see that it is on the right hand side of a single equal sign. And on the left hand side of, the, of a single equal sign is something we haven't seen before. And that is an L1 comma L2. And what this is, and it's specifically used with returns that return multiple values is a list, a collection, not in the exact sense of a Python collection, but a, a list of variables that you're going to assign values to in the order that they were returned. So I have two values being returned. In this case, it's two lists, but it could be two numbers. And so on the left-hand side, of a single equal sign, I need to have those two, I have to have two variables to accept those two values. Because remember, a return is a transition point. So I'm transitioning from the scope of my function back into the calling scope, and I have to have the right things to make that translation happen. And in this special case, you have to have multiple um, variables to accept the values that are coming out of the function. So let's go and take a look at that. I promise not to keep you way, way too long tonight. So, uh, nope. Is that it? No. Swap. Uh. Yeah, T1. No, I don't think I have that one. What's this one? No, that's the dollar and pennies. So I don't have this one typed in. If you guys want, I can type it in quick, or we can just go through the labs. Why don't you let me know in the comments if you want me to type it in, and we can just work through it. If not, I'll start talking about the labs, and I can always circle back. Oh, okay. Uh, type, please. The labs. <laughs> uh, Rebecca, do you mind if I if I take two minutes to type this in and go through it? Does that work for you? Okay, we'll do. Okay. So, move it. Actually, what I can just do is something similar. I will take, okay, now that's the move between rooms examples. Um, I don't know, new, I don't even know what challenge that is. Python file, um, multi-move, we'll just call it multi-move. Death, swap. Val one and val two. Um, so this is going to be similar. Oh, sorry, just wrote Java. Just reverted to Java. So I'm going to uh, temp equal val one. Val one equal val two. Hope oh, this isn't one of your labs. Val 
two equal temp return val one and val two uh, swap okay v one comma v two equals swap forty two three point one four okay. So this is just a quick one. This isn't exactly like that one. This is just a gen generic swap. Every language you write a swap. Every programming class you write a swap. This is a swap. So here's what's happening. I'm sending in two values. I could have done any input stuff. I'm not going to worry about it right now. I'm sending in two values. I'm going to remove them and then I'm returning them. So let's see what happens when I call this and when I return back. So I am going to go into my debugger. Whoops, wrong one. Edit the configuration. Let's do multi-move. OK. So let's go back to multi-move, debug this guy. So I'm here, and I'm calling this swap. And I'm calling it with 42 and 3.14. So I'm going to step in. And a standard swap is you have some temp variable, you put one of the things in that you want to swap, and then you just move the other stuff around. So I'm going to say temp equal val1. So temp is now 42. Val1 is now val2. So val1 is 3.14. Val2 is temp. So val2 is 42. And val1 is 3.14. So I successfully swapped. So here I'm going to return them. So I'm going to step over. Oh, I should have done something like this. Uh, and V1 is, V2 is, OK. Oh, did I do? Uh, anyway, we'll do it this way. Oh, wait a minute. We'll do it this way. B1, sorry. B1, whoops. B1, B2. Okay, so let's do this again so we can actually see what they are. So I'm going to step into it. I'm going to step over. Everything is swapped now. Val1 is 3.14. Val2 is 42. Now I'm going to step out of the function. And when I step over, I see that V2 is 42 and V1 is 3.14, which is what it should be. But what's happened is that from my swap, I have gotten new val I've gotten the two values out in that in the right order with the right values and then I'm just going to print it. So and this could be anything. I could be modifying this. I could just say you know val1 is val2 times 100 and val2 is temp times 100 and I could run it and I would get 4200. Oh, sorry, V1 is, 3 point, is 314, and V2 is 4200. So it could be anything. And in one of your examples tonight, it's going to be five things. It's going to be dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies. So that's what a multi-return does. So we'll go into the labs now. OK, so lab 5.18. So this is our swap. So if you were here and you saw it, you will now know what a swap is. This is a swap. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to pass in two values, and then we're going to swap those values. We're going to return them, and then we're going to output the new values that have been swapped. So this is a multi-return, and it has param1 and param2, and it's basically what we just did. Don't tell anybody because they'll get irritated with me, because I usually don't give out lab answers. OK, so here is an exact change 
problem. We've done this before. This was done in module three. We had the exact change lab. We had to go, we had to use the floor operator. Assuming you did okay on that, start with that. Don't rewrite the wheel. Take what you did, take the portion that you did in, th in, in that lab in module three and put it into a function. Not the print stuff, just the calculations, because that's what this is. So we're going to have a calculation that is going to print dollars, nom. So it's the exact, we're, we're sorry, we're going to create a function called exact change. Exact change is going to take user input, and then that user input is going to be some value. And what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to find the number of times that you have 100 is in that in whole numbers, and then 25 is in the remainder as whole numbers, and then 10 is in the remainder of whole number, and 5 is in the remainder of whole number, and then we get our pennies. So that calculation is the calculation you did in, uh, in one of the labs in Module 3. You don't have to rewrite it. Just start with it and put it into a function. Make sure that you indent it properly, and then add at the bottom this return. And so you're returning the values for dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies. And then you simply use the same print that you used previously. So all you're doing is adding this return statement and putting that stuff from Module 3 into a function. Okay. Um, this is part two of that. So the first part was defining the function. The second part is exactly what you did previously in module three. This part doesn't change. Um, do you guys only have two labs? I guess you only have two labs this week. So that's it. Does anybody? Okay, good. Good job, Joshua. Does anybody have any questions? And you can open up the mic. You can put it in the chat or you can open up the mic. And the questions don't just have to be about this week's module. They can be about any of the previous weeks. And it can be about the upcoming, um, the upcoming projects. Going once, going twice. I'm glad we got you unstuck from the return, Bria. Um, Professor, we are regarding the, um, good Lord, my brain is toast today. It's 10 o'clock. Everybody, it's 10 o'clock for me. My brain is toast, I promise. So for, oh, for our our assign one of our assignments, we can do a pseudocode or a flowchart, correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. So you can, you can choose whichever you prefer. Okay, perfect. I just wanted to make sure. I think I'll choose the flowchart. That's fine. That's I would too. <laughs> I prefer flowcharts to pseudocode. Um, as for your question, Joshua, Yes, you could also put the print statement in a function. Um, you don't have to. The, the important part is that you get one of the functions right and what Zybooks is looking for, what the teachers are looking for, because this is kind of what the guidance, guidelines tell us we're looking for, is that that calculation is in a function and that you are returning from that function. That's the important part. If you want to add, go ahead and add. So does anybody have any other questions? Okay, going once, going twice. Okay, everybody, have a great weekend. This will be up tomorrow. 
um, along with the notes and all of that, please, if you're in my class, email me if you have any questions at all. And I will see everybody next week. I'm going to stop sharing and stop the recording. And everybody have a wonderful